my name is Lane Schuler. And my name's Courageous. And together we are INK. Um, how did you guys get started on this path? Well, I got started um, right out of high school in college. I was actually um, through middle school and high school. I was a theater arts performer and I got into spoken word poetry through a workshop when I was 13 years old through the Carpetbag Theater's youth theater ensemble. Um, and then I kept performing and I met Lane in 2009 as the host of the Knoxville Poetry Slam. So that's where my poetry career kind of began to meet up with Lane and I'll let Lane tell you about it from there. Yeah, so I uh, started out as a hip hop artist. I put out an album in like 07. And when I moved back to Knoxville, I was expecting a big vibrant hip hop scene with like lots of rap shows and that did not exist. So my really only option to get my words out was to go to the poetry shows and start like working some of my verses into, into poetry. Uh, and that didn't really work out very well, as Courageous can attest. Um, once I started focusing more on sp like rap being rap and poetry being poetry, um, I saw a lot more success and me and Courageous hit it off. We are, uh, we're uh, like three months apart in age. So like we have a lot of the same interests and watched a lot of the same movies and things like that. And, um, we toured around a little bit competing in that and poetry slam, national poetry slam, regional poetry slam. We had some decent success doing that. And then we, uh, were approached by a TV show and an agent. And once that started rolling, it was like, let's go, let's get this thing and let's just travel the world. What was the TV show? It was called Verses and Flow. And the story is kind of funny. Every poet in America was trying to get on Verses and Flow. And we rolled the dice and somehow we got them to love our video. And they, they hit us up. They're like, we want you on our show. We need you to change two lines, two lines in this poem. And I was like, you got it. And then they're like, we need you to come up with a name. And I was like, you got it. We'll come up with a name. So we asked the lines and we, Courageous, you can tell the part about the, the name uh, INK if you want to. So during that, after I graduated from UT, uh, I wanted to start my own business as a performing uh, venue that for poetry and jazz and live music, all kinds of stuff. So I got a uh, space downtown, rented out a space, started picking it up and I called it The Ink. So the uh, place, Knoxville's downtown performance lounge on the corner of Cumberland and Gay Street um lane helps was helping me fix it up at the time and get it ready for performances and to open the doors and uh, the the hazards of being a young business owner without a lot of business experience <laughs> came and went and we had that name the ink and we just started thinking about how it could translate into the work that we were doing since it, the logo was basically a pen and a microphone so we became the ink and then we figured it would be a lot cooler if it was I N K just ink. And there we were. And we, come, we said we will come up with what it stands for later, but this, the TV studio does not need to know that. Yeah. Um, so we said, all right, our name's I N K. We, we fixed the poem. They said, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, we found somebody else. We don't need you to be on our show. Have a good day. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Um, my name is Hector. Hey, okay. I remember um, Hector. I remember Hector too. How you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. As a child, what did you want to become and why? You got it, Lane? I, I have a very funny answer to this question. So I was cleaning out all of my stuff. Like, so my house burned down when I was a little kid. And then most of my stuff has just been stored at my parents' house since I moved out in, I guess, 2014. But I found this old childhood psychological evaluation where they're like trying to figure out if I was gifted or not or all that kind of stuff. And there was this segment in there about how skilled I was verbally and how good I was with words. And I don't remember being verbal. Like I remember like wanting to be in front of people, but I don't really remember like being no, like be, being recognized as that. So I thought it was really cool that the, the, the school psychologist was able to recognize that in me before I was clearly able to recognize that in myself. Um, but I had an interest in being a radio DJ, which for you kids that don't know, radio is like this thing that goes out in the air and it comes to your car and it used to be like people locally would like talk to you. 
Uh, and basically, I went to school for that, but by the time I graduated, radio had pretty much died. So it was like I went to school at a horrible time for a horrible subject. But uh, yeah, I always had an interest in talking and speaking and, and thought it would be cool to be a musician. But where I lived out in towns and there were no guitar shops, guitar lessons, no real strong way to be musical. So really, my voice was the only instrument that I had. And for me, Hector, I think I realized, well, uh, so when I was in third grade, I decided I wanted to be an oceanographer. I thought it was so cool to study the ocean and what was underneath everything. Uh, so for me, that's what I started out wanting to be. And then slowly, as things progressed, started developing a love for performing when I was 13, a little bit older than you are now. And I started wanting to perform. So most of my life, I have always wanted to be a performing artist whether it meant acting or poetry or some type of theater, involvement with theater, that's what I wanted to do. Ever since uh, I got the chance to perform in 2012 in Harlan, Kentucky, for a group of people who were changing their own community through art. And I think it was the best, most ever been a part of. So that kind of, that moment in 2012 when I got to perform for the group called the Network of Ensemble Theaters. I got to perform for them a poem that I wrote about being from the South and, mm -hmm. and the love for where I was from. And that was really what made me wanna be a performing artist for the rest of my life. So that was about 10 years ago now. So that's how I found it. Okay. Question for now. Hello, how are you? Hey, Good. Where? how are you? Yeah, my name is Elijah. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so what are the biggest ways you've had to adapt to challenges and obstacles in pursuing your passions? And how have they, how have they shaped your mindset going forward towards your goals? So um, I feel like a lot of eighth graders have goals, but they're afraid they're going to be judged or afraid they're going to be, you know, like somebody's going to say something. So how did you, you know, shape your mindset going towards your goals? Um, a big adaption had to happen in 2020. We uh, we played the largest convention for college performers that exists in probably the world, uh, invite only. We we headlined. We played the main stage and had the longest set. And the phone was ringing, and our agent was like, "You guys are gonna go all over. This is crazy." And then COVID hit three weeks later, and all that momentum stopped. So we had to pivot to virtual. And virtual is admittedly not as much fun as traveling to Miami to do a show, but it's rewarding in its own way and it was uh, it was unique and interesting so that is that is one story about being able to adapt very very good, good yeah i think for us also just thinking about the idea of being able to have jobs that will allow us to travel in addition to doing the poetry i think for us it was just kind of deciding that we wanted this more than anything yeah so we wanted to make sure that our our time was available to be able to travel and even going into jobs just letting them know like hey i do this for a living and i want this to be a large part of my life and letting them know like if i have to choose then i will choose this so please can we make it so that my schedule will allow me to not have to choose and i yeah. think that was the biggest thing lane got into real estate which makes it kind of easier for him to be available during the during the day and to do things on the phone or maybe using the internet and for me, I took over a position at the Carpet Bag Theater as a as a starting as a managing director, and now I'm the executive director. Oh, but that's amazing! Company, right, thanks. It's an arcs company, so when I have the time to make my own schedule, it makes it a whole lot easier. And I I also encourage all of my staff to pursue an artistic medium as well. So I've got a staff member who's a photographer, another staff member who's an actor and an entrepreneur another staff member who is a community activist and makes time for his work serving our serving our beautiful community in Knoxville, Tennessee. So just making sure that everybody has a passion that they're following, but also doing the work that's involved. So it's one of those things, trying to figure it out and make a way the best you can. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. That was a great response. Um, um, who was your biggest influence in your youth? Um, probably my brother. Having an older brother is like, you're just gonna do whatever they do, so like, he was in writing, I was in writing, he was in a certain type of music, I was in a certain type of music. So that's probably one of my biggest influences. As far as like people actually in my sphere, from like artist perspective, uh, music was weird when I was in middle school. It was just weird. I guess it's weird now too. Um, I guess it's always kind of weird, but. 
I think probably my biggest influence was a guy named Seed Lynn. Uh, he's a poet. He's a person that actually got me to figure out what slam and, and spoken word poetry sounded like. So for me, it was uh, taking a workshop from him and realizing like he he uh, he did this poem called Teacher Please, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. And y'all might y'all might love it. I don't know if he's uh, I don't know if he still performs it or remembers it. This was probably 20 years ago. Um, so just thinking about that poem, but it, it expressed all the frustrations I had in school. I know you've never had that, but <laughs> there's uh, just thinking about all the things that I was thinking about at school. And I was like, this guy gets it. He knows me. He knows what I've been going through. And it was so cool to see that artistic form really be able to speak what I was thinking at that time. And that's yeah. what hooked me on spoken word poetry and performing and making sure I had the courage and the, the will to perform my words and feel value that they had some importance out there. And oddly enough, Seed Lynn mentored me as well when I first got started on a much different area of my life, but we both ended up having the same, same mentor at one point or another. So that was kind of cool. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have you had, have you ever had difficult, um, like hot topics through your poetry? Sure. Yeah. We actually, one of our most recent poems, we discussed the, the idea of racism in our, in our society and how we can overcome it by just being able to sit down for a conversation between the people who have differing ideas. And I think we've always, ever since we kind of came into it, we wanted to see the guy that mentored both of us always taught us that sort of like, as far as creative arts goes, it's like there's three levels. The first one is identity politics, right? It's like, I'm this type of person from this background. The second one is the parody of that or the playoff of that. And then the top level is transcending that. So with every piece we do, we try to transcend that, not necessarily avoid it, but transcend it. So with our Daryl Davis poem, which which outlines um, this, he's a uh, blues musician and he's a an African-American blues musician who basically sought out to befriend members of the KKK, to sit down with them and talk to them and basically force them to look at themselves in the mirror and go, wait, am I wrong about this? And he basically sort of used love to change these guys opinion on something and to me that was the hugest story because we live in a society right now where everybody gets on social media and wants to just hate on people they just want to hate and they want to be angry and they want to make fun of people and it's clearly not working like it's clearly not working we can look at any metric that you have and it's it's not working but we look at his way of doing it and it made way more sense and i truly believe people are capable of change and if you look at his story everyone's capable of change, but we have too many people in this world right now that are, they, they think that the others over there are after them are bad, or they think that they are in a high and mighty position and they are educated. So the others over there are just trash that live in trailers that hate people all the time. And so they're butting heads. But what we find is when they sit down, they actually have a whole lot more in common than we realize. How much more in common. Thank you. You see, Shakespeare is the undisputed king of modern English. He taught us how to put the swagger back in our language. See, back then, Cool Herc was kind of like Homer because he was the one that started. He stretched vinyl on a table and spun it to make epic magic the way Homer stretched out papyrus to write wonderful and tragic. And the truth is, the Iliad and the Odyssey were kind of like rappers the lie. Because they were long and drawn out and most of the verses ain't quite fit right. Right, but, 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 but. They were the building blocks, but what came next? Before the burnt CDs, MP3s, and the printing press. You know what it gets me thinking? Okay. The Apostle Paul must have been kind of like Pac. Ah, because they paint pictures of perfection pinned, pinned on, on the, the cross. cross. And yes, it was similar how they were lost. But by now, shouldn't it seem strange that we, we always, always kill, kill the people capable of change? change. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, Barley, Martin, Malcolm, Paul the Apostle, John Lennon, the Beatle, Paul McCartney, the Beatle.
the brimstone bath. And when Martin, Malcolm, Big, and Pop passed, they called it assassination. But the strangest thing was, Shakespeare invented the word assassination. Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Douglas. Frederick Douglass was just like outcasts. Because okay. they weren't afraid to speak real, real talk, talk about the real, real South. South. And when dreams got deferred, they moved stone, stone mountains with their, their mouth. mouth. Biggie. Biggie. Biggie was just like Edgar Allan Poe. Because they both spoke mighty, mighty and heavy and slow. And they both told great stories of storm clouds and dark skies. And they both loved their moms for, for most of their, their lives. lives. And nobody, nobody knows exactly why they died. But, but their words grew wings and continued to fly. And you can still hear them rapping. You can still hear them rapping. You can still hear them rapping at my chamber door. Like both the Raven never more. Smoking man. No Encore for an assault that I caught in Breezeport, New York, and I am sure the last bullets are like the Wu Tang Clan. How can so many sounds and voices move like one man? Arrest in peace, ODP. And RIP, Gil Scott. It's not where you're from, where you're at, it's what you've been taught. And I have learned a lot about what I am not, and Shakespeare was not. No sissy little white boy knows Preston a book. No. No, he spun stories and flown fiction about not judging something by how it looks. He knew exactly how to drop tragedy with, with knowledge. knowledge. And just like Kanye, he, he never, never finished, finished college. And in his home, he had two, two beds. beds. And his was the second best. And the best was reserved for his guests. And we are his guests, the authors of what comes next. We could write the next Othello. Macbeth. Romeo. Juliet. King Lear. Even Hamlet. The future dead poets. Future dead rappers. Future immortal martyrs. Live wires and fire starters. Masters of our fate. Right into deracinate and assassinate this debate. And pay homage to the... The very first white rapper, very first rapper, Graham Master Shake Shake. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated, I have a dream that my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Do you feel that in 2022 America that this dream has been accomplished? Uh, I can say a pretty easy no, not at all. I think it's something we're working on, but I think it's we're starting to come to a point where things are beginning to be ripped so far apart that the only way is to start bringing it back together. So for me, it's uh, things kind of have to get worse to get better. The ball has to hit the ground in order to bounce to its highest point. So that's where I think we are, is I think we're getting as bad as it can get before everybody just kind of looks around and says, like Lane said, hey, this is not working, <laughs> and yeah. it's time to do better. So I, I think saw a piece of data not too long ago where it showed sort of like general opinions on people based on uh, it wasn't like, hey, do you dislike people of the other race? But it like it basically just showed them like sort of coming together until like 2005, six, seven to like more even ground, like acceptance, and then they kind of started batting back apart again. 2008, 9, 10. And the, the thing that I think probably has a lot to do with it is social media. It's, it's the way it's designed is just not, it's not good for society. And I think we are kind of, we're in another realm where like, you know, 20 years ago, or it's maybe longer than that, but like black kids wouldn't, they we didn't want each other to play with white kids and vice versa. And now like that that mentality still exists but it manifests itself in different ways but then there's also the like well this person's opinion is stupid and is not valid because they are white or this person's opinion is well they're not they're not an expert in this or this person has more privilege than that person and we're playing identity politics a lot and i don't know if this is like advanced but i guess it's it's good for everybody to hear but when you play that game too much it can kind of become this sort of circular firing squad where everybody dies because everybody has a, a weapon to pull out and say well no you did this and and your group did this and your group did that but if we can get beyond that and sit down at the table and break bread then we can build a, a kinder and gentler society absolutely i think that was beautifully articulated and you had all the research steps behind it so i think my kiddos will have to research some of that um, for my last question, do you guys have anything that you could perform on the fly real quick before we close out? Is that too much? M maybe not. Do you, we could do, we did a Homes of Love poem for a nonprofit. Courageous that would be beautiful. Does anything we could try in at the end? I'll come back here. You can be in the video. I think I found it. <laughs> Sweet. All right. We're going to try to roll through this. We'll see what happens. It might not sound the greatest. You know how these, uh, these things pause That's a little okay. Oh, That's okay. I kind of put you on the spot. I apologize. I know I hadn't said anything in advance, but worse. This is what we do. <laughs> these are all the poets who want to see it. So, Lane, uh, let's see. So we all know it takes a village to raise a child, but what does it take to raise a village? It's a village. Well, you need infrastructure, water, soil, people. Yeah, well, not just people. You need uh, the community. 
Right, a group of people dedicated to bringing out and celebrating the best in one another. Yeah, you need uh, you need places to stay, right? You need homes. Well, yeah, but what does it take to make a home, right? Okay, well, you need a roof, four walls, a door, uh, you know, maybe a place to cook food, store food, place to sleep at night. No, see, that's what it takes to make a house. What does it take to make a home? You need love. Yes, that's, that's what, what makes a house a home. Care. Guidance. Emotional support. Trust. Protection. Stability. Nutrition. What about a room? A room for those who've been left alone, without comfort, without warmth. Living. No, existing. Thing. Constantly in harm's way, without, without someone. someone to make them feel like it's just all going to be okay. Where's your part in all of this? Will you be the one to help protect a life? A life that was set in motion by the same creator who gave you breath. One that may not be flesh of your flesh. But equally deserves to call themselves blessed. This, this is, is not, not a test. test. No, this is an opportunity to do your part. An, an opportunity. opportunity to be the one to provide a fresh start. A new beginning. Pinning new chapters in this story. We're all right. About this global village we're building. From the ground up. Knowing. That the greatest of these is love. Love. Happy Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> Body. I love how you did that just on the fly like that. Thank yeah, you, guys. Oh, so okay? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. We brought the house down. <laughs> <laughs>